Our students can be dismissed with Pastor Jesse at this time, and the rest of you can find yourself a seat in the house of the Lord for a few moments. Thank you for worshiping with us. I want you to find your place, not just in your seat, but in the text, and we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4 tonight as the students find their place down below the campus for their time in the Word of the Lord as well. Ephesians chapter 4, it's taken us a while to get this far in the text, and I'm glad to be back in the saddle tonight on Wednesday. Appreciate so much the men filling in for me last week as our family was away on vacation, and they did a stellar job. I appreciate the crowd still being here, even when I was out of town. Look at all them young people. My goodness, that's bigger than some churches. Amen. Thank you so much, young people. We love you. We honor you and support you here at this church. Appreciate you so very much. Ephesians chapter 4, I just want to share a couple of verses with you. I don't think I'll be able to belabor much longer in the context tonight, not because I don't want to teach for a while, but because there's so much here, I don't want to theologically overload you. I feel like sometimes if I go too quickly through verses, I mismanage and I missteward the text because there's so much here. I literally could stay in just this first verse. I mean, you know, we're, we're months into the book of Ephesians, and to be honest, we should only be months into like the first paragraph of the first chapter, right? There's so much. That's the beautiful thing about the the flow and the authority of the Bible. You can read the same verse many, many, multiple times and get a fresh new application, although the interpretation never changes because no scripture is any private interpretation. The application still just flows over us like water. I tell the men every Monday morning at 6 o'clock at the Hilton, I say, look, guys, may the word of God wash over us like water. We should every day, not, not Wednesdays, not Sundays, every day, you should take a bath in the Bible. You should take a shower in the scriptures, right? You, you should allow the word of God to wash you. By the way, men, say amen, men. Amen. The Bible says if you want a productive marriage, what you do is you wash your wife in the water of the word. There's nothing that will stop an argument faster than you popping up a Bible just start reading it. You see, your wife thinks it's hot when you speak King James English. You wash her in the water of the word. Amen. That, that's how Jesus is going to return in the last days for a spotless bride. Because the thing that's going to make us spotless is the word of God. It cleanses us. Amen. It cleanses us. So Ephesians 4 is where we are. Father, bless the word of the Lord to our hearts for the next few moments. I pray that I will speed up when you want me to and slow down when you want me to. We know your word says that the... Steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but I'm convinced by faith the stops of a good man are ordered as well. So step us and stop us, Lord. It takes just as much faith to step as it does to stop. So I pray that we'd follow you, we'd listen to you. Holy Ghost, we pray that you would speak to us tonight. You are the greatest biblical teacher and professor in the universe. So speak through me, but speak past me. So people don't see me, they see you. Move us in this house tonight to want to do more for the kingdom. In the name of Jesus and the church said... Ephesians chapter 4, we're really just going to jump right in. I'll probably just kind of be on the floor with you more than anything else tonight. Ephesians 4 in verse 1, Paul says, I therefore, shout therefore. therefore. Whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you look and see what it's there for. It's there for the reason that chapter 3 ended with the glory of God needs to fall in the church. It's Jesus' church, not your church, not my church, not our church. It is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a Baptist deal, a Catholic deal, a Pentecostal deal. It is the church of the living God. And because of that, Paul said, look, I'm a servant not to the church. I'm a servant to Jesus. And so he says, I therefore, now watch this. He goes deeper now than calling himself simply a servant. He goes one step further. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Now, let me tell you what he's not saying and then kind of extrapolate a little bit what he is saying. He is not saying it's like prison serving the Lord. Okay, if serving Jesus to you is boring and mundane, you are clearly not doing it in a biblical manner. Because Jesus did not come to give us life more redundantly. He came to give us life more abundantly. Can I get a witness, right? And so he's not saying, oh, man, I feel like I'm in a prison because I'm serving Jesus. What he's saying is, because I'm serving Jesus, I'm in prison. 
I remember some time ago when we were taking our very bold and declarative stand in 2020. We had a man leave our church because, and we had very few people leave, but thousands of people showed up. But a man left our church, his family left our church because of the stand that we took. He said, I'm afraid you're going to get arrested. And I said, well, what difference does that make? He said, I can never sit and serve under a pastor that goes to jail. And I'm like, do you realize that Paul wrote 14 books of the Bible and 75% of them he wrote from a jail cell for standing up and doing right, for keeping the church open, right? Can't sit under a pastor that goes to jail for doing right. My goodness, all of us going to have a jail ministry one day if we keep going the way we're going. So he said, look, I am the prisoner of the Lord. And I like that. That's okay. I told the men, you ask them. I told them this past week on Monday morning, and you men ought to be there. It is one of the greatest services we have all week. I told them, I said, look, if you go to jail for righteousness, I'll bail you out the same day. If you go to jail for being stupid, you sit in a little while before I show up. (laughs) Right? Go to jail for righteousness sake. And he said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. It's amazing how many people say things like this. My goodness, when it all comes down to it. Well, first of all, don't say that anymore because it's all come down to it. It's all come down to it. But they say, well, when it all comes down to it, I'm going to go to jail for my faith. You ever notice the people that say that don't even go to church for their faith? I'm going to die for Jesus. Why don't you just live for Jesus? If he calls you to die, great, but you'll never die for something or someone that you don't consistently live for every single day. And so he said, I am a prisoner of the Lord. And he wasn't bemoaning that. He wasn't like, call my lawyer. It's not my fault. No, no, no. He's like, you know why I'm here? Because I'm serving Jesus. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Now watch this. Beseech you, the Ephesians and the Global Visionites. The people watching online and the people in this room. He said, I beseech. It's a military term. It means to beg, to urge. There's some passion behind this. He said, I beseech you, watch this, that you walk worthy in a respectable, fear-filled manner. That you walk worthy, I love this, of the vocation wherewith you are called. Now, I know some other versions may say some other things, but I love the flow of the King James here because uh, the, the historical nature of it is exactly right. He means job. He means vocation. He doesn't say ministry. He says you ought to work, work, walk worthy of the vocation. Then he says this, wherewith you are called. Now, let me tell you why that's interesting. Because even though you may have a full-time job and not a full-time ministry, you are called to turn your full-time job into your full-time ministry. You see, we have this hokey idea in the church world that pastors are supposed to have the power of God and they're the only ones. No, stay-at-home moms, plumbers, electricians, over-the-road truckers, teachers, we're all supposed to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. These signs shall follow them that believe, not those that have been to Bible school. Right? And so he says right here plainly, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. I don't care what your job is. Your job is your mission field that you are called to. That you're called to. People say all the time, well, I'll tell you one thing. If I had the opportunity to be in the ministry, I'd lead so many people to Jesus. Have you ever one time talked to people on the job about Jesus? I get missionaries that come to me all the time. We would love to have your support because we're getting ready to go to the mission field. I'm like, well, what are you doing while you're preparing? We're raising support. Why don't you raise up people for the kingdom of God and let God take care of the support? You see, why why would I put money behind somebody to go across the seas when they won't even go across the street and knock on their neighbor's door and witness to them for the gospel, right? Am I telling it? You see, you are called to the vocation that you have. Now, I know sometimes your job seems dead end, and sometimes it seems like you're not using your gifts properly, and, and you're using all of your gifts just to make your boss a lot of money. I get that. But at the end of the day, if you'll be a good steward of where God has you, then eventually God will move you, and you don't always have to have greener pastures, by the way. Don't always be like, well, I'll tell you, one day, if I get the perfect job, you're never going to get the perfect job because you're never going to work for the perfect boss. Okay, you're just not going to work for the perfect boss. We're not. We're all flawed. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 118, verse 8, it's better to put trust in the Lord than confidence in men. Because man on his best day will fail you. Because man on his best day is still man. And so he says, look, your job is a ministry. 
And so it's interesting that he doesn't say that you are called in the ministry. He says you are called in your vocation, and the calling is to make your vocation a minister. If that makes sense, say amen. And by the way, he says this from prison. So he's like making license plates. And he's using it as an opportunity to be called to the ministry. He's writing. You know, a a lot of times people need to recognize, and and, and I say this with, with all sincerity and humility of heart as your friend and your shepherd. Sometimes people need to recognize that what you have right now is enough to do what God's already called you to do. You see, a lot of times pastors are like, well, you know, if we had the tent, if we had the sound system, if we had the blue check mark, if we had the charisma house publishing behind us, if we had all of those opportunities, no, 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 no. If you will not use what you already have, then don't ever ask God to give you more because God never blesses people with more if they can't handle what they've already got. Because if you can't handle what you already have, if God gives you more, you will mismanage it even worse than you're already mismanaging the little bit that you have. Because if you can't handle a little bit, God will never give you a lot of bit. Right? He just won't. Because everything in life is the principle of stewardship. Stewardship is not just giving. Stewardship is using properly the tools and resources that God has given you for the furtherance of the kingdom. And when you understand that your house is to be used for the ministry, your car is to be used for the ministry, your computer and cell phone technology is to be used for the ministry, your marriage, your children are to be used for the ministry. Everything we have is a stewardship. And if we will steward it well, God will give us more. God will give us more. That's why Acts chapter 2 says, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Why did he keep adding to that church? It's not like they didn't grow from 120 to 3,120 in like one fell swoop. Why would God keep blessing them? Because they were faithful with the money, the resources, the facilities, and the people that God gave them. So God's not looking for people to bless. He's looking for people to trust. And when he finds the people he can trust, he has found the people that he will bless. Because the blessing of God always comes after the trustworthiness of God. Does that make sense? And so he says, use your vocation. You're called to it. Now, verse 2. Now, notice how we are to live, how we're to walk, how we're to work, even in secular arenas. You know, I I get it. Sometimes when people work full-time in the ministry if they're not careful they can get a skewed view i've talked to our staff about this before you can get a skewed view because you get used to working around christian people that think like you think and they think like your pastor thinks right but here's what he says here's how all of us are to walk in the world you may be a waiter you may be a server you may drive a gravel truck whatever no matter what you do here is how you walk worthy of the vocation God's called you to. Watch this. With all lowliness. Now we have been lulled into the ridiculous notion that lowliness is impoverishment. That what we have to do is walk around like we got bad backs and beat ourselves with a whip we got to make ourselves lowly, and we, we got to do all the grunt work. No, 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 no. Lowliness is an attitude. It's a characteristic of consistent, constant humility. Lowliness. It, it means, in essence, not that you have this fictitious humility. You, you know what's worse than arrogance? False humility. People that pretend to be humble. It's like the people that say, uh, I wrote a book called Humility and How I Obtained It. Right? Okay, be careful. Lowliness means that I am not exalting myself above you. But I'm preferring you above me and I'm walking in lowliness. And then he goes on and explains and says, and meekness, which we always say is strength under control. And indeed it is. But I remind you, a couple of months ago, we preached the definitive sermon of our church, right? Of 17 years of all the things that Jesus said, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. I can't be any of them except one. I am meek and humble of heart. That's the one character I can emulate that Jesus exampled for me. Now, Jesus did not come as an example. Jesus came as a substitute. So he dies as a substitute, but he lives as an example. And the example he left for me to emulate was, I am meek and lowly. He even says in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, that he humbled himself, made himself, made himself of no reputation. 
and took upon him the form of a servant. And so here, Paul says, here's how you walk out your faith in the secular world with all lowliness and meekness. Now, here's the simplistic application to that. Here's how I know that we're tracking the right direction. Because it's hard in the world, it's hard in the church, but it's hard in the world to walk with lowliness and meekness. Because normally the first thing you want to say is the last thing you should say. You're tired, you're edgy, you had not had a lot of sleep, you're, you're fighting to pay your bills, you're fussing in your marriage, kids are acting crazy, you go to work and it doesn't take much, boom, somebody pops off one good time and it's hard to walk in lowliness and meekness. I'm learning the principle of walking in lowliness and meekness. There's times to crank up the amperage, you understand, right? But you don't let people walk over you. But you also don't walk over people trying to exalt yourself because a lot of people try to get ahead by pushing everybody else down. You know what I'm finding in life? The more I propel and push others to succeed spiritually, the more doors God opens for me and pushes me to succeed spiritually. Let me tell you something. I, I really, honest to goodness, and, and, and Holy Spirit convict me if, if there's any, any lie or any tinge of a lie in this. I have absolutely no ministerial jealousy in me towards people that are mightily blessed of God. And I'm not just talking about prosperity and riches and, you know, fancy $22 shirts, right? I'm not talking about all that. I'm talking about other churches that are being abundantly blessed. We, we were at Lock Media today and we had a, a show that we were doing with a lady and she was talking about the jealousy that's in the ministry and the spirit and why won't preachers get behind people that are successful? It's because they're jealous. It's, 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 it's a shame. And I'm like, man, I want other people's churches to grow. I, I want every church in America to baptize 10,000 people in three years. I would love for them to grow, outgrow their buildings. I would love for them to be financially and abundantly blessed. I would love for that. But most preachers, a lot of people in the ministry, the church world, we can't handle that. Like I said this past weekend, the, some of the people that won't make the sift and the shift are those that cannot rejoice in the blessings of others. I rejoice when God blesses you. I want you to have nice things in your marriage. I want you to have nice things for your kids. I, I want you to have whatever it is the Lord wants you to have. There's nothing wrong with having stuff as long as stuff don't have you. And the reason God don't give a lot of people a lot of stuff is because he knows the stuff would have them. And what they need to understand is God never told you to renounce your stuff. He told you to relocate your stuff, to send it on ahead, to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, to not lay up treasures upon earth. Because at the end of the day, things that we worship, God can make it a bucket of bolts at a stoplight in the next 15 seconds, right? So it's nothing wrong with having the things. It's when the things have us. And yet if we walk in lowliness and meekness, we will understand that when we propel others forward and we help other people move and grow and mature and we even use our influence to open doors for other people, not only does that bless them, it will bless you. God will honor it. God will honor it. I remember, I'm just chatting with you. I remember when our platform really began to grow. And not, not even just numerically in the church, but the, the influence, the, the, the social media persona, the celebrity, whatever you want to call it. I remember when it really began to grow. And one of the reasons I think it grew with such rapidity, is that a word? So quickly, is because when my influence started getting big, I wanted to take people on the journey with me. So I would start promoting other people so that their platform could get big, right? And, and of course, now, you know, everybody wants to pay for ads and everybody wants to, you know, s sell stuff on my page. And, you know, here's my iTunes, here's my cash app, here's my, you know, can, everybody wants to put a GoFundMe. You know, hey, can I have a GoFundMe on my page? I'm like, whatever. And so now, now everybody wants promotion. But what I found is there's just some times that you can just get behind somebody and say, you know what? I'm just going to give them a little nudge. I want them to be successful. I want to help that man's ministry. I want to help that person's business. I want to bless them. I, I want to I wanna look at their GoFundMe fund me account and although I may not share it on my page guess what they've only raised 200 bucks they're trying to raise 5,000 bucks let's just put them over the top right and you support people and you love people and you help people and you do things like that and you know what God does when you open doors for others he opens doors for you you have to learn to walk in lowliness and meekness because you need to understand something the kingdom's not about you and the kingdom's not about me the kingdom is about him and when you serve him you do that by serving other people Right? We, don't, we don't get the privilege 
as did those in the New Testament, to physically, in the natural realm, wash the feet of Jesus. So how do we do that? We do that by washing the feet of others. Jesus said, if you will give someone else a cup of cold water, it's as if you have done it unto me. Because you've done it unto the least of these. And so we won't rehash the whole I am meek and lowly and humble of heart. But I'm telling you, it, it's where we need to live. It's where you need to be in your marriage. It's where you need to be in your business, in your ministry. When I'm in this pulpit, in your prayer closet, everywhere that you go, you need to walk with lowliness and meekness. And that's not always easy. And that's not weakness. And, and that doesn't mean that you walk around mushy-gushy and compromised to a buck-wild, demonized culture that just wants you to compromise. No, no, no. You stand your ground. You see, part of meekness is the ability to be courageous and stand your ground, but sometimes just keep your mouth shut. Right? It's that simple. So he says, here's how you walk your calling out with all lowliness and meekness. Now, notice he's now going to expand that just a bit with long-suffering. Now, I won't besmirch the word or the text by saying so, but I think it would do us well sometimes, no matter what version is in our lap, to spell that word with about 20 O's. Long suffering. Because that is what most of us do not have. It's why we're impatient in our marriages. It's why we're impatient. You ever notice that this... Uh, Instant society of everything just comes in a minute has made us so impatient. And we think it's like first world problems. Uh, there are like people around the world like having their arms sawn off for the gospel. But watch how Americans react when their phone's at 15%. <laughs> I'm going to have an iPhone <laughs> anxiety panic attack. You know why? Because your iPhone has become an idol. And listen, we, we are so anxiety-ridden as a society, we just don't have patience for people. We immediately write that we don't have time for people, right? And so he says, no, 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 you treat people with long-suffering. You know why? Because God treats you with long-suffering. Because if he didn't, you'd be in hell with a broke back tonight. And then he says, forbearing, watch this, one another in love. Forbearing. You know what forbearing means, literally? It literally has the idea. Now, I'm not talking about glossing over sin. We don't compromise sin. Sometimes you got to confront your friends and family about sin and rebuke them in a righteous way so they can get right. Because rebuke leads to repentance if it's done correctly, right? But you know what forbearing means? Not talking about overlooking sin. It means that there's some things in people's life you just got to look past so they can grow into it. Because one of the worst things you will ever do is wish for people to grow and be where you are when it took you 15 years to get where you are. Don't love people for where you wish they were. Love people for where they are right this very moment. Because somebody picked you up out of the miry clay when you weren't worth two flips of a wooden nickel. And they loved you and discipled you and matured you and nurtured you and, and paid for you and helped you and loved you and bottled you and changed your diet. Right? They loved you where you were. And the problem with the church is we want to love people where we wish they were. Mm -mm. You love them on the journey. So there are some things that are better unsaid. I mean, when you get somebody privately and you deal with them, then you deal with them. But there's some things some, you just got to forbear. You just got to be like, you know what? I'm going to work on that, but I'm not going to rebuke them for it. Here's a great principle you ought to live by. Public sin deserves public confrontation. Private sin deserves only private confrontation. And you know what's wrong with a lot of us? We think it's spiritually to publicly rebuke private sin. If it was done in private, you go to them in private. Now, if they blew up their testimony, they blew things up royally for the church, for the cause of Christ, then Matthew 18 says you bring it before the church and you deal with it the way that you should. But if it's a public sin, don't make it a, a if it's a private sin, don't make it a public nature. That's why... I can guarantee you theologically that when Matthew 18 was written, there was no Facebook. Social media has ruined, ruined the concept of biblical context. 
It just has. And I know we live in that social media realm. But I'm telling you, it's ruined people because it's given people the idea that they can come off half cocked because they know John 3.16 and they can rebuke anybody they want to and there's no ramifications or there's absolutely no fallout for it. And they're like, well, I'm not hurting anybody. You're hurting a whole lot of people. You're blowing people's faces off. We have to forbear one another. And why do we do it? Because it's in love. And we speak the truth in love. Again, we don't overlook sin. But there's sometimes you got to go to a brother. you got to go to a sister. And you got to say, look, there's some things you and I need to chat about. We need to talk about. Well, take them and love them enough to confront them privately about the things that you see in their life. But nobody wants to have those conversations. Right? We, we just want to ignore it. Or we want to blow people's face off. We want to have passive-aggressive Facebook posts, you know, because it's cute on Twitter. It hurts people. I promise you, I, I, listen, I promise you, Facebook and, and things like Facebook, but, but the reality of Facebook, and I'm not just knocking Facebook because we're on it. We're on it right now, and I thank God for it. Okay, it can be used correctly. But I promise you, you will never convince me otherwise of what's about to come out of my mouth. <laughs> there is nothing in the history of humanity that has caused the modern day church to be more like the church at Corinth than Facebook. I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, I'm of Jesus. Nothing has caused more division in local churches across the American landscape than social media. Because we're able to say things and not forbear people. And sometimes we say things. And we say it perhaps with the right heart, with the right spirit, with the right motivation, but when it doesn't have the right context, right, it comes off unloving. Uh, I don't have to go into all the details, but I, I talked to, uh, to Julian. I call him Jules. I talked to, to Julian the other day about this. Uh, a video was, was on one of our pages, and it was a great video. It was a fantabulous video. But there was a part of the video at the beginning that only people in-house would have understood. N nobody online would have had any context to what was happening. And so in-house, it was laughable. But online, it came off meaningless and abrasive. So I, I texted him real quick and I said, hey, pull that video, put it back up, but take the first 35 or 40 seconds out of it. Because they're already getting lit up. And so we took it out, put it back up. Nobody ever thought another thing about it. Why? It's not because what was said was wrong. It was because what was said seemed not to be loving because nobody understood the context because they weren't in the room when it was said. Does that make sense? And so we have to be careful, not just what we say, but how we say it. Wow, so much could be taught on that. So he says, for bearing one another in love, and I want to get to this verse, and then we're just going to have to just, just shut her down. Endeavoring. <laughs> That's a beautiful word. That, that's a beautiful study word, endeavoring, doing anything and everything that you can, having some discipline, ma making your mind up, doing whatever you can do, endeavoring, working hard, sweating, praying over this, endeavoring to do what? To watch, keep the unity of the, notice, capital S, spirit. It's the Holy Ghost that brings about unity in the body of Christ. You know how I know that? Because humans can't do it. I mean, we can't even get along with ourselves, right? We don't even agree with the people we look at in the mirror. But when, when two people were the only two people in all of created human history, they couldn't even get along, and the majority was wrong then. It was just two people. But when the Holy Spirit is introduced and unleashed and at will to work in a congregation, you know what he produces? Unity. He produces unity in the body. But notice what we're to do. He does not say that, that we produce it. No, no, no. We keep it. We handle it. We steward it well once it's been produced. Keeping the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I'm going to tell you something. I'm learning the older I get. That there are some people in my life that just don't bring me peace. And that's okay. You, you don't have to feel unspiritual about that. Because when some people say, oh, I want to be at peace with you, what they mean is, I want a piece of you. 
I want to break your heart into a million pieces, right? Okay, it's like communism. We want peace. Yeah, they want a piece of this, a piece of this, a piece of this, and a piece of this. And there are some people that have a communistic Christian mindset. They want a piece of everything you have, but they don't want peace with you. Because we have peace of God and peace with God, we should desire peace with each other. So he tells us that we are to keep, we're to fight for what the Spirit of God brings about in the church, peace. That means, sometimes it seems demonstrative, sometimes it seems a little abrasive, but that means that you have to deal with the people in your individual life, and we have to deal with the people collectively in our church life that will not allow us to keep the peace. There are some people that are inserted by the enemy to keep things stirred up. You see, the devil is just as good about sending people to churches as God is. Because I'm going to tell you something that a lot of preachers won't tell you, but it's the facts. When God takes a liking to you, so does the devil. When God gives you legitimate anointing, the devil will send people to you with a false anointing. And you have to endeavor, I have to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. And that doesn't always look nice. That's why sometimes you're like, ooh, who's he going to call that? Sometimes we have to dismiss people because they're peace killers. Now, let me, let me fix an, an old wives' fable because here's what everybody likes to say. Well, you know, the Bible says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacekeepers. No, 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 doesn't say that. It says blessed are the peacemakers. You see, peacekeepers. See, we're endeavoring to keep what the Holy Spirit gives us, right? Because it's a Holy Spirit peace. But we've been taught and, and sold this ridiculous, nonsensical American idea, this bill of goods that, well, what, what we are called to be are doormats because in everything, every expense possible, we are to just, we're just to keep the peace. Now, that's passivity. You're not called to be a peacekeeper. You're called to be a peacemaker. And as a peacemaker, sometimes you have to get rid of that which is keeping you from having peace to begin with. Does that make sense? It's that simple. I don't even have to say that abrasively. That's the facts. Peacemakers have to create an atmosphere of peace. And in order to do that, you have to dismiss people that don't allow you to move forward with that creation. And so he says the local church has a responsibility for unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You know, there is nothing that will allow you to sleep better at night than a peaceful marriage, than a peaceful home. As a pastor, I seek and I search and I pray and preach and fast, even when it comes off a little demonstrative, for the sake of unity in the body. Listen. I am at more joy and relaxation when there's peace in the church. But you know what happens? It happened tonight. I don't have to go into details. Five minutes before service started, somebody showed up at the A-frame to confront me. You know why? Because the devil knew if I can take away his peace, he cannot transfer it to the people in the congregation because you can't give out what you ain't got. And I always know on Sundays and Wednesdays when the devil's going to stir things up. It's when the protesters show up. It's when the haters show up. It's when the people that shouldn't have my phone number and have it start texting me, start calling me. They show, oh, we want to confront. We want to confront. Whatever, whatever, yada, 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 shmada. You know why they do that? Because the enemy sends them in to take my peace. Because if I get up and don't have peace, I'm not able to transfer it to you. That's the facts. That's called impartation. I can't give you what I don't possess. Right? I, I can't get up here and preach on joy if I have none. I can use the words, but the expression of my heart will not translate to you, and you'll walk out, and you'll be just as depressed as you were. Listen, if I walked in here tonight like, you know, Eeyore, like we are, oh, boy, you know, if that's the way I preach, that's how you'd walk out. You wouldn't come back. If I got up here and I was like, well, yeah, yeah. that was some half-decent worship. <laughs> Do better next time. Right? That was a you know, debacle of a, of a communion time. Great job, Pastor Justin. <laughs> right? If I got up that way, he'd be like, 
I'm like, well, let's open the book of Ephesians. You know, Pastor Jesse, take them kids down there. You ain't going to teach them much, but just take them down there. Bunch of little rebels. They're probably going to sit around listening with earbuds and they're not even paying attention to you know how. I don't even know why we teach these kids, right? What are we doing? And that's how churches act sometimes. I got to be like, well, you know, dear, dear beloved, just open your Bibles to Ephesians 4. I ain't going to keep you long tonight because I ain't got much to say. You know what that does? That translates to you. And you'd quit coming because there'd be no excitement in that. You'd be like, holy smokes, I should stay home and watch a soap opera if I want that much drama. <laughs> right? But when we work at maintaining and stewarding the peace that God gives us, sometimes that means we have to bring the right people closer and we have to push the wrong people out. And some people don't understand that. And that's okay. I'll be the guy that goes to my grave with the black eye for pushing out the wrong people. But I always know they were the right people to push out as the wrong people by the way they respond when they get pushed out. Because what happens is their assignment to steal, and this is individually, their assignment to steal your peace has been hijacked. So they will do everything they can, even act more spiritual and more humble to get back into your life so they can continue to wreak havoc because their assignment was not to bring you peace. It was to keep you from it. But when they show you who they are, believe them the first time. Amen. Amen. Believe them the first time. I had one of them, uh, one of them messaged me yesterday. And I'm going to be honest with you. Anybody ever been to that little, uh, there's this little hibachi place in town. It's not the sit-down place. It's the little drive through place. It used to be Crystal's. And uh, so I was, at, I was at the bike shop trying to figure out this whole, you know, fiasco with the bike and, and this. And so I was hungry as a hostage, right? <laughs> and that's hungry. So I, I went down and rode this little hibachi place. It's right next to the little Starbucks. And so I'm, I'm going through the drive through And my wife was doing some things with some ladies. And, and so I, I knew, you know, I got, I got time to eat. So I went through, and I had this little order that I get, and it's good. I mean, they got some of the best food around town, right? And, and I was hungry. I was ready to go. So I pulled out, and I was coming back to the church, back to the office. And, and I, a lot of times what I'll do is, just so I can have a few moments of peace and not have to always be around people, I'll stop in the middle of a little pull-off over on Tate Lane. There's not a whole lot there, right? There is now. When I was a kid, there's nothing there. But nonetheless, uh, I, so I, I pulled off. And when I did, my phone went, just gave me a little ding. And it was my messenger, Facebook. About two weeks ago, I had reached out to somebody that had been in our church for a long time, two years in fact, on the deliverance team, traveled on the bus, did, did excavation work. I mean, had a lot of responsibility. And, and I reached out in sincerity. And I'm like, you know, two weeks ago, and I'm like, hey, I, man, where you been? You, everything okay? Hadn't seen you. Boy, did I get a book. I mean a book, a bully book. I sat on tape like I didn't even eat. I took one bite of an egg roll. It, you know, I always know when the devil's trying to get in my head because I can go from zero to 100. I can go from starving to death to fasting for days. When, when, can I, when people get under my... I, just, I, I can sit down to the best steak house in this town and somebody in this church can text me something in a smart, elegant way and I'll, it'll ruin my appetite. I can't even eat. Can't even eat. And so I'm like reading it. I'm like... And I, I told them in... in a little bit of righteous anger. I'm going to read it, but I'm not, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to read it. I ought to, but I won't. I was, I've had people talk to me like a dog. But it's not often I have church people that talk to me like I'm vermin. I mean, it, it, it really, it, it threw me. Now again, if I would listen to not just Holy Spirit, but Holy Wife, I wouldn't run into this situation because she told me six months ago he was going to blow my face off. 
that he was a womanizing piece of garbage. She did say that. Of which there are women in this church that let me know after the fact he's a womanizing piece of garbage. And he's watching right now. You womanizing piece of garbage. I'm, telling, I'm, I'm saying calling us everything you can imagine and unbelievably accusing our church of some of the most atrocious things that could ever be said. I mean atrocities. And calling, I mean just, and it's always the same thing with this little group of people. Oh, they don't really give their missionaries that kind of money. They're absconding with all the money. I'm like, yeah. It's written out. We just had a full bank audit that we passed with flying colors. Okay? And they're like, well, they don't really give that money away. And then the other, they're like, well, they're using the adoption ministry, no, ministry to sex traffic children. I'm like, do you even hear yourself when you talk? I smoked a lot of dope before I got saved. I've never been that high or that stupid one day in my entire life. Never. I've never been that high to say such ridiculous things. I mean, that is asinine. That is crazy. That, that is beyond anything I can even imagine. And, and I mean, this guy just went, what did the kids say? Ham. He went ham. And I'm like, I just wanted to know where you were, bro. It was horrible. I mean, it, there's, there's very few things that shock me in life. That shocked me. I was like, man, we, we, we gave you keys to the kingdom up in here. And, and, and then all of a sudden you, you get offended by one little bitty tiny and it was just this spirit of offense. And I'm like, N- now all of a sudden we're low down, good for nothing, sorry. All our staff's a bunch of warlocks and witches. My wife's a Jezebel. My kids aren't worth a flip. I'm not even called to be a pastor. We're stealing all the money. We're, we're, we're using all the, the money that we're bringing in just to, to keep people in port johns because I'm a manipulative pastor. I'm living in, in the riches. I'm like, y'all crazy. Y'all Y'all got powder on your nostrils. You are snorting something. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. I'm like, I don't know another pastor in America that's more vulnerable and and open book than we are about what we got going on here. And I'm like, it, it, it blows my mind that people can get just offset about one little thing. And they're just gone. You never preach the Bible. I'm like, really? Did, did, did you ever pay attention of all the times I did? You're so arrogant. I'm like, do you never pay attention that I like to publicly apologize when the Holy Ghost tells me I'm arrogant? You see, people want you to repent when they say so. Not when God says so. Learn the difference. Learn the difference, right? Right? And then it's crazy because they, they all end up yoking up with the same people. <laughs> it's just the craziest thing in the world. People that I got up in the church, I, I ran other people off to stand up for the people that ended up blowing my face off. And the other people that left the church were right about those people. And now they're all just siliquized up together. And I know they, they call some of y'all. That's fine. I can't tell you who your friends are. I'm your pastor, not a pope. But dear God, you ought to figure out when people give you peace and when people don't. If all they can do is just talk smack about somebody else, that's not peaceful. That, that's just not peaceful. And, and it's just, it, it kept me up last night. Nothing ever keeps me up. I mean, we've lost all kind of people through the years. They don't keep me up. But I was just like, I was like rereading it. God said, just block him. Quit worrying about it. And I was just like, this is disgusting. What this guy is saying about our church. When we've done nothing. 
And then I'm like, oh, no, oh, oh, yeah, oh, okay. Well, that sounds like, oh, yeah, well, no wonder it sounds like so-and-so. You're liking all their Facebook posts. <laughs> wow, I thought Greg Borchers actually left the church. Hmm? See, I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide. I don't care who you hang out with, but when I show up at a restaurant and you're sneaking around with people that hate this church, I don't trust you. I don't trust you. Joseph Z gets up here. He's like, I feel like the Lord wants somebody to give $100,000 to this church. Am I good or no? Okay, I won't. I won't. So then this woman stands up. First one. He's like, oh, there you are. Give $100,000. That looked cute in front of everybody. Ananias and Sapphira. You didn't give this church $100,000. And, and, and then tell people, well, we was able to get it back. You was able to give it back because you never got it. You never gave it to begin with. But we're the bad guys. We're the ones, hashtag, ask pastor because they're sex trafficking children. I mean, it's crazy. You got to read the stuff he said about my kids. And I told him, I was playing, I was like, look, let's, let's, if, if you want to have a meeting in our, at our office, it's all good. You brought Jesse up, so we'll bring Jesse in. You brought John up, we'll bring John in. I said, but look, here, here, here's what we're going to do. Everybody okay, by the way? Yes. I'm just being calm. I said, here's what we're going to do. I said, uh, we'll just discuss this stuff, but don't bring up what you just said about my wife and my family and my kids. Just leave that off the table. Well, what if I do bring it up? Are you threatening me? I said, here's the deal. Just don't do it. He'd be like, well, you a, you a pastor. You ought not talk like that. Let me tell you something. Before I'm a pastor, I'm a husband and I'm a father. I'm a protector. And if you don't protect your wife and protect your kids, you're crazy. So, I mean, th th there ought to be some things that get you righteously indignant sometimes. But I get it, man. It tore me up. It hurt my feelings. I was like, this is, this is crazy. I, I sincerely reached out. So I just blocked them. And I'm just like, these people won't stop. So then I always know they're talking because all of them text me today on the old phone. They think they got my new number. They wear that old phone out. Remember Barbara? She sent me a book today long one you better repent you're going to be exposed at the conference i'm like i hope dear god i am so this thing will be over with <laughs> right golly troy fritz sent me a text today i'll be there at the conference i'm like no you won't <laughs> huh? you, you won't uh, you, i'm sorry you just won't all right and, and and they all just start and then it Everywhere I go, did you, did you hear what this one said? I don't care what they said. They never tell me what they say. Right? I don't care. I don't care what they think about our church. But they just don't quit. Because they have an agenda. The agenda is to take away your peace. And I, I wished I would have learned earlier in deliverance ministry... And we're learning. I wished I would have learned what I'm watching as the failure of a lot of pastors. And the failure of a lot of pastors is if we don't get quicker discernment, we will end up pe putting people on the prayer team that do nothing but operate in a spirit of confusion and divination. Because they seem prophetic and they seem powerful and they seem anointed. They are prophetically powerful and anointed to bring chaos to the church. They just do. So it's crazy. I blocked as many of them as I could. But every last one of them are watching us right now. All of them. And, and I, I'm at a place where I'm like, man, I'm sick of once a month or so. How do you bring it up? 
but they keep trying to drag people into it. Because they can't handle unity. They can only operate in a level of not being peaceful. And they always find each other. I don't, it's crazy. They always find each other. People that haven't been here in like eight years, find them. People that haven't been here in like five years. People that blew our face off early and then like dropped off the face of the earth. And I'm wondering if they're even still alive. I'm like, it's been all of these years. How did you yoke up with Chris Terry on Facebook? <laughs> right? How do you even find each other? But I figured out how they do. When I used to preach at youth camp. You know what would happen? It was a phenomenon. The first night of youth camp, there could be a thousand kids there, 800 kids. None of them knew each other except for their own youth group. You know what would happen? By the time the first service in youth camp was over with at Fort Bluff camp, every rebel from every youth group had found each other and was sitting in the back within the first two hours. Chaos is attracted to chaos. They're addicted to it. So, for whatever that's worth. Sometimes I just, uh, I know you do, and I'd say that stuff whether you love me or not. <laughs> There's the danger in that. <laughs> but uh, I just, I'm, I, I'm just too old to mess with people that want to take my peace. I want, I want to give peace. I want to be a peaceful person. I don't want to fight. You know? I still pay for crazy people's meals when I walk into restaurants and they don't even know it. I walk out and be like, I'm paying them people's meals. I'm like, I don't want to. I'd rather spit in it. But just pay for it. <laughs> just being honest. I'll put you... Oh, I can't believe he says that stuff. <laughs> I can't believe you're still here after I've been saying this stuff for 17 years, right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not changing. I'm not any different. But I just want to say one thing to vindicate our church and I'm done, okay? Just, just because I feel like I need to because this is what a shepherd does, right? I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail. But I find it interesting that all these people supposedly have all the goods on us and never show it. But you know why? Because in so many regards, I have all the goods on them and haven't shown it. You see, we got big screens. They don't have big screens. I got surveillance footage. I know who stole cash out of the offerings and I got it on video. And don't think unto God I won't put it on a big screen and show the whole world. That's why they don't come against me. Because they don't have nothing against me. They don't have nothing on me. They don't have nothing on our church. They're absconded with money. Prove it. You can't. You can't. And you'll only whisper it and you'll not verify it publicly because you know you get sued for slander and defamation of character because you know it's not true. And so, it's crazy. People just say the nuttiest thing. Remember that show? Kids say the darndest things. Butt hurt church people say the darndest things. That's a new reality show right there. Don't be one of those people. If we ever disagree, let's sit down and talk about it. If we can't come to a happy medium, then you know what? I'll send you out in love. I'll send you out in peace. Because when good people leave good churches, they stay good. Yeah. What about it, Brother Brandon? Am I telling him? He knows. He don't, when people come against you in church, it hurts. Holy smokes. It, it can tear a whole church to shreds. A whole congregation. Just because of a few whisperers. So I wasn't going to go into any of that. But when I pulled the pulpit back and I thought, let's just sit down and chat for a little bit, right? I'm going to go into any of that. Because I don't have to justify it. I, I don't have to, you know, I, I don't have to take up for myself. I don't have to take up for the church because, you know, no weapon formed against us. Shall pro if, if they had anything on us that took us out a long time ago, that's why I'm not worried about it. I mean, that, that kind of stuff don't bother me. What bothers me is the people that you love the most, you help the most, and you support the most spit in your face. It's sad. It really is. It's sad. It's heartbreakingly sad 
that the ministry has more drama than Second Avenue and Broadway tonight in Nashville. There is more hate that comes out of churches than there is hate that comes out of, you name the place downtown tonight. That's a shame. The Bible says when Paul was shipwrecked, guess who showed him kindness? It says the barbarians. It's sad when the barbarians are nicer than the Bible believers. Sad. So again, I know sometimes I say names and I, and I say stuff. And I, I, I reserve that type of speak for, for a Wednesday night. And I know it's online too. And I know they're watching. But I just don't, I don't play games with the church. You want to know where the money's at? Come down there and find out. Look at the bank statement. IRS would have got us a long time ago if we had some problems. Okay? We've been the most vocal, well-known, outlandish church in America for a number of years. There's not another church on the planet that CNN has had a bigger love affair with than us. And you really think if we had all that stuff going that they would not have already indicted us for the fourth time. You, you, use your thinking cap, kiddos. If there was something there, it would have already been revealed. Stop believing ridiculous people. Don't let stupid people have a place in your life. What God's doing here is supernatural. So I'll just stop by saying, I'm going to do what Jesus did. Just get down on the ground and write as though you hear them not. God gives you a justifiable right to not listen to stupid people. Amen. You can't. It'll, it'll steal your peace. Stop letting them steal your peace. And I let them steal mine sometimes. I let them steal my joy. Yesterday, I was like, at least let them steal my appetite. And, and we just, we, we can't operate like that. Because we have a responsibility to endeavor we have to fight for what God's given us. We have to fight for it. Because God's not doing this everywhere. And if we take it for granted and just let any Tom, Dick, and Harry have the microphone and everybody's a prophet and everybody's this and everything. No, no, no. That's why only a certain number of people lay hands on people. Because we've got to steward well what we have. Because if we don't, we're opening the doorway for the wrong people to come in. And we can't. And so, I close with this statement. A lot of times, churches will, I don't know, maybe in the, in the sincerity of their heart. And I, I hope people don't take a clip of this and use it against me. But in the sincerity of their heart, it's why we will never have a sign outside that says this. That they... You, 90% of the signs in this town and all over Wilson County, you know what it says? Everyone welcome. Not here. Troublemakers aren't welcome here. Liars aren't welcome here. People that want to rob your peace and rob my peace are not welcome here. And if the atmosphere is right and supercharged by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, they'll reveal themselves soon enough. You believe that tonight? Thank you for letting me be, uh, just be real with you. Stand to your feet all over the room. Father, thank you for the word of God. And thank you sometimes that we just can be real with each other. We ain't got to put on these makeup games. Jimmy Carter, smile. We can just say, hey, look, wow, this is crazy. And it would shock some people in this room to the core if I did name that man. And no need in doing it. Lord, I pray with all my soul that you will keep drama off this campus. Not just out of this tent. Out of the parking lot before it even gets in this tent. We pray all the time. Bring the right people here. You are bringing people from around the world to this house. We thank God for it. Bring them all. But put up so many divine roadblocks to the people that are coming here for the wrong reason that they never make it to our parking lot. We don't want them. We don't want them. We don't want them. Lord, even you put up a wall around your kingdom. 
Even heaven's got a gate to keep the wrong people out and the right people in. So God send your angels to be the gatekeepers of your glory in this house. And they can give us a black eye and they can besmirch us and they can talk about me on Facebook. All they jolly well want to and they can try to draw as many hearts from people that are well-meaning but have no discernment. They can try to pull them all away. They can do it. They can try to sow all the discord, but at the end of the day, I know what's going to happen this weekend. People are going to be saved. Converts are going to be baptized. Demons are going to be cast out. Cancer is going to be healed. People are going to get out of wheelchairs. Homes are going to be put back together. You are going to bless. We're going to give 80% of everything we have to missions. We're going to remain debt-free. We're going to stay in a hot tent. And 10,000 people are going to show up from all over the world to come to this deliverance conference to be set free by the glory of God. We thank you that in the midst of craziness, the Holy Ghost brings us peace in the name of Jesus and the church shouted out yeah. I love you get around hug each other we're family amen